and welcome to this newest episode of the Scrum Down NBC Sports Rugby Podcast. I am your host with the most, Alex Corbisera, and it is great to be back, everyone, coming off the back end of a big weekend of rugby on NBC Sports. Here in America, we had the Rugby World Cup Sevens, which we hosted across NBC, CNBC, Peacock, Lots to talk about on that. We're going to have Dan Lyle on to recap some of that as we covered it across the weekend, making my hosting debut in studio, which was a big marker for me, and I absolutely loved it. And then we're going to get on to the Premiership. Premiership Rugby has kicked off. The opening round went down on Peacock TV this weekend. We've got a special guest to talk about the Premiership and a lot of other topics, none other than AJ McGinty, USA Rugby superstar, new signing to Bristol and the one who kicked the winner for them to take the win over Bath on the weekend. We'll hear from him, and we'll also review some of the premiership action on the weekend. Lots of things to look forward to. Thanks for listening. Let's get on with the show. Welcoming USA Rugby Hall of Famer and NBC pundit Dan Lyle to the Scrum Down. Dan, welcome back on the Scrum Down. Second appearance in this new rebirth in video that we have, but let's get into it. We had the Rugby World Cup Sevens across NBC Sports all weekend. It was great atmosphere, great to be on camera together in studio as well. But, you know, let's talk with the men's bracket first. We had uh, New Zealand losing to Fiji in the final. Fiji avenging that loss in LA. You know, what, what did you make of them in, in the tournament a little bit for them th throughout the weekend? Yeah, Ben Gullings had his side primed for that tournament. They never looked like they were going to lose that tournament, Alex, you know, certainly one through 12, all, you know, performed extremely well. They used his entire bench. Six players scored in that semifinal. Five players scored, all individual players, no back to back, no tries, no braces. You know, it's, so the entire team was used, you know, and their skill sets were in full display. The offloading ability, as we know from Fiji, was awesome, and they just were in full flight. It, it was outrageous, mate. Like the, the lack of rucks, the ability to keep that alive, the flow they had. Like in a, in LA, they looked hot at times, but in that final, they really came unstuck. And you know, this was much more the Fiji's that you know that beat South Africa in the Commonwealth and just put that stamp on the game. Like their attacking rugby was amazing. But what I loved about them is that final second half, two yellow cards, and their defense is what won them the competition. Unbelievable. The like you said in on the show, the way they go hunt teams. They use their physicality. They're a nightmare to try and play against. They smothered New Zealand in that second half to really make sure they didn't let that game slip away from them. Yeah, they're almost like, you know, Panthers or Lions in that hunting, right, where they're not just attacking you, right, right boom, 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 hyena style. They're, they keep you in front of them. They find you, they, they, and then they isolate you, and they pounce, and then they come in, you know, all together. It's, it's a really uh, – when it's in – you know, in form, when they're in form, you know, they look fantastic and, and you know, well-deserved. And, uh, you know, you couldn't pick an MVP because I thought there was four or five of them that were just, you know, yeah. outrageous, you know. And just so cool, you know, they, they, it's their second Rugby World Cup, won the other one in 2005. And, you know, you've got to credit New Zealand that, that these guys – thrive in these competitions back-to-back -back champions hadn't lost a game since 2009 in the rugby world cup seven so i think for fiji to go out there and take them out in the final it stamps it really well that they were the sort of best team in the competition now let's transition to the women's bracket where i felt the final again had the two best teams these teams are going to play each other a lot over the next years a couple years i'm sure australia new zealand australia coming out victorious and they just looked a bit of a class above at times. They just have the all-round package, the ability to move the ball, the ability to play. They have running threats, and then their defensive hustle. That's where I think Coach Tim Walsh has taken them to the next level. He's harnessed the attack, but the defensive work that that team has now is outstanding. Yeah, you got to be super connected in the game of sevens, right? Obviously, in rugby, you have to, but in sevens, it's even that much more important because the ball is going back and forth. I agree with you, Alex, you know, that walshi has been able to really bring that defensive prowess into their game. But they were the most exciting team 
to watch as well. You know, the New Zealand are the all ballers, mate. They invented almost in the women's side that sevens, you know, theater capacity, you know, all skills all the time game. But, you know, Australia's almost taken it to another level. They found, you know, ways of, of not just not just, you know, offloading, not just being balls in hands, not but power, pace, connectiveness. It was it was really, really great and uh, what a great final. It, it was outstanding. And it's just, this is the thing. A, a year ago from now, you would have said no one beats that New Zealand side, especially as they got Porsche Woodman back right on the back end, but they still had so much talent. There's a few missing with injuries and stuff at the moment. Nathan Wong and Ruby Tui's with the 15s and, you know, a few, but really that, that team was untouchable. And for such a short turnaround with such a young side as well that has so much room to grow and improve, it's a, it's a scary thought for, for the other teams that are, are running into that olympics in 2024 how do how do we how do they catch them uh well i mean triple crown right commonwealth series winners and now rugby world Cup winners you know look the the they did not look fantastic against the u.s side that was probably overperformed to get to fourth place and so they are vulnerable a little bit sevens is one of those games that'll humble you very quickly as you said fiji was humbled against new zealand earlier in the tournaments uh, in LA, excuse me, you know, so it's a game that can come back and sneak up at you. If you're not in full flight, look, th those girls performed together because they were collective, you know, and, and while she had them, you know, really buzzing, you could see the smiles on their faces, you know, during the anthem, you know, both teams to be fair, but they were just so happy to be out there. So happy to put their shoulders around each other, arms around each other. So it was just a great uh, spectacle. Well deserved those two teams in Australia, you know, to come out in the final. Nah, I agree. All right, let's transition to the US. And, you know, the, the men's very disappointing coming in 11th. It all kind of got unstuck for them in that opening game against Samoa. And, you know, th th it's been a tough run since the Olympics, since the sort of disbanding a lot of the OGs of that team. Some moved to MLR, some have, you know, sort of re retired as such. And and the team just is, is got a lot of youth, a lot of inexperience, and it was hit with injuries at the moment as well, which I thought just diminished their ability to compete with those top teams. But it's still a little alarming that how much of a drop-off that they have had from where, where they were only in, you know, 2018, 2019, where you'd argue they were top three in the series. Yeah, you need, you know, two or three playmakers, you know, to rotate through your team. When Madison Hughes stepped away, Stevie Thomasine, Kayvon Williams stepped up. Obviously, Falau Nua had that horrible injury. He tried to make a comeback, and they really haven't settled on that. Obviously, Kayvon Williams being injured. So they're in, and Madison Hughes, is he coming back? Is he not coming back? Right. So that whole playmaker side of it is out. You know, the aerialists, the side of it that Zach Test and Colin Holly and then obviously Ben Pinkelman and Danny Barrett took on. You know, Jay Schroeder took that mantle a little bit, but then got injured in L.A. as well. And, and rugby is really a game of that you have to play well together. We talked about the Australian women's team just look like they were in each other's pockets. And I, I just thought the U.S. team has got to really reboot, find that consistency, find those selection, probably find two or three more players. And, and it's all for 24 now, right? Two years run in. Yeah. They got to think about what who they are and use 22 and 23 season on the series to find the combinations, find the new players, you know, find that confidence and, and really you know, just – just play and maybe even find a new style, depending on what all that stuff looks together when, as you mix the cake batter. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think that the fact that, um, you know, some of these senior guys who are still hanging around now, but your Perry Bakers, they, will they make it to the Olymp uh, next Olympics? They, they still got it. Like, it's still got it. It's just an uncertainty. It's probably the last Rugby World Cup we'll see for Perry Baker. Will he make it to the Olympics? Will more sort of, of, the, of the veterans drop off? And then it's an even bigger sort of task to elevate what you have now to your experience and still fill within underneath as well. Yeah, they, we need to see, you know, the depth chart, you know, one through four in all 12, 13 positions, see what that's going to look like, you know, how how and who's going to be coaching this, you know, on a year-round basis. Mike's, you know, comes in and comes out, you know. You obviously got Ben Pinkelman now and Zach Test that are in Chula Vista down there helping to train, you know, some of these ancillary tournaments, you know. You know, in L.A., we have an, uh, a great elite tournament, so I'm really interested in, 
what that second level is going to look like. So LA is important, not just for the, uh, the starting 12, but the next 12 be below that. So all of that is important. And you got two years now. And then the U.S. women's team, you know, they came fourth place, which on paper looks very, very good. I do think their performances weren't quite as strong as the finish. So they had a very good game against Poland, who actually went on to win the cha the challenge bracket. So you know that they were a good team. So I think they started hot. But then after that, just didn't really quite find their form. Scraped by a very young Canada side. You know, then they had uh, the, the game against um, Australia and you know, it was just a, a, a tough ask for them uh, and then losing the last one uh, against France as well. Yeah, um, you know, their form uh, and the, where they finished really flattered, uh, I think, what they were actually putting on the field, you know, and that, that, that that's not about effort. There's effort and execution conversation, but it's about game plan. It's about combinations. It's about, you know, the combination of... of the ladies from uh, sevens and fifteens, you know who who the right you know players are, and and really you know you have to be able to step off of your uh, off of both feet. You have to be able to you know sit players down. You have to be able to you know do more than just you know um, you know create a, a mismatch from a, a big and a small and just use your pace out wide. They need more dimensions. You know, they need, they need more dynamics, uh, you know, within that team. So I think the tactics and strategy, as well as some of the combinations, you know, need to uh, be refreshed a little bit. They, they too, have two years, right? So this is a team, yeah. uh, it feels like in transition, too, although they have more of the players right now. And those that are coming to come back from the 15s World Cup as well, you know, do they stay? Lev Kelter, to me, you know, when she's on form, that team was on form in sevens, right? And she chose to chose to go to 15s, or maybe it was chosen for her to go to 15s. And uh, but um, you know, we need players that you know are able to run straight, run direct, but also run some angles, offloads, etc. No, c c completely agree. I think the middle playmaking is the big issue here. It was at times very lateral, very one-dimensional. You know, you've got to credit the athletes in that team. Alona Ma trucked, you know, a, a number of people straight through. Jazz Gray had some bright sparks, especially someone so inexperienced on the circuit. You know, the, 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 Nia Tapper had some moments. K Kirsch is, Kirsch is still in the mix there. And, and But I just felt like that try against uh, Australia where Heatherlin goes through the middle, we need to see more of that. More stressing people in the middle, not allowing people just to, to drop off and sort of shepherd us to a touchline and then come at line speed and try and pressure their skills. Because that, to me, right now is the issue. And it is a little bit worrying some because this is a team that wasn't that much different on paper. Like, there is some change, but it's not incredibly different. But a year ago, they were beating Australia at the Olympics. Do you, do you know what I mean? Pretty much a year ago now. And so... That is the only thing that to keep an eye on is Australia have gone up leaps and bounds and U.S. kind of have to find their mojo because otherwise they will get left behind by those top two. You know, France aren't far behind. Fiji still have growth as well. You never know what Canada are going to do if they get some, some, some time together as well. U.S. just doesn't want to fall out of the pack because... You know that program needs to meddle for that for, for really the catalyst for the for the explosion, which I know is one day going to happen in America. Is women's rugby and especially sevens? They are such a catalyst for everything that we want to go well in the sport over here. Yeah, I think we, we know what they're not doing right now. You know, I I think it needs to be a little bit more apparent, transparent. You know, from the what they're going to try to do and what their you know what their game plans is. It, it's not it's not a, a state secret. You know. When, when you look at the United States, you know what the way that they're going to play, right? So they need to be a little bit more unpredictable, find ways to, as you say, go through the middle, offload games, play in some layers and all that stuff. And so not knowing what's going through the coaches' heads and what's going through the program right now, you know, this, certainly they need to improve. Otherwise, they're going to get left behind. I agree. No, definitely. And this, you know, some bright sparks and some exciting stuff. I think some players that were maybe, you know, inexperienced before and maturing into veterans and leaders on that side sam sullivan you know looks like you know a revelation for them came on didn't have many moments but when she did she looked sharp and, and i've seen her play some club, club rugby as well and she's a well-rounded player that i think they could you know look to use a bit more and they just gotta get back to the kickoffs too man like that team usually holds on to the ball and they, they they trash everyone but at the moment they're not 
They're not back to where they were in some of those areas. And, you know, Alev's restarts make a difference. Abby not being any more, obviously, a difference. But they still have great aerialists. They still do. So they have to sort of come back to some of those key KPIs that I think make them, you know, the team that, you know, we all want them to be. Yeah, I agree. You know, uh, enough said, but, uh, you know, certainly room for improvement. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and fourth place is no... Uh, you know, as no mean feat, but, uh, you know, we, we just see the potential and opportunity, I think. Yeah. No, absolutely. Dan, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's great to have you. You know, we've really appreciated it. Loved working with you on the weekend as well. And I'm sure we'll see a lot more of you on the scrum down this season. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. It was fun and uh, good luck with the scrum down. I'm really looking forward to not only being on in the future, but seeing all the special guests you got lined up. Well, that's a wrap for Dan Lal on the show. But now we have our big guest of the episode, USA Rugby superstar Bristol debutant on the weekend, kicking the winning penalty to beat Bath on the weekend. None other than AJ McGinty. All right, here he is, our big guest for this week's Scrum Down episode, USA Rugby and Bristol Bears rugby player, AJ McGinty. AJ, welcome to the pod, debut on the Scrum Down. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks very much for having me on, Forbes. Appreciate it. Just coming off the back of a, of a big weekend, back in premiership action, you know, not long sort of preseason time to get settled into Bristol Bears, but you guys got off to a winning start and uh, must have felt good to kick that last penal at the end and, you know, just get the, you know, get the juices flowing, but also, you know, get <laughs> get, get the lads in a bit, of, you know, just feel like you're part of the team. Uh, yeah, definitely. I guess you could say that. It's obviously first experience playing in sort of the derby as well against the local rivals, Bath, and uh, even though, the game got postponed, like the, the atmosphere and the, the turnout was phenomenal. Like it was, the juices were, were flowing on the sideline as I was like crossing my fingers that they, they'd bring me on. But uh, yeah, no, it was, it was unbelievable to get on and then to, to win as well. It's just like the atmosphere is incredible and kick the kickstart the season off on, on the right foot. So uh, yeah, very pleased and everyone's happy today in, in camp. Well, let's talk a bit about Bristol Bears and your, you know, your short period of time there. But you know, what what sort of made the the move? You know, you've been at Sale for a long time, very established. You know, made yourself into one of the form tens in the competition. Was it the connection with Pat Lamb, or what, what got you to sort of consider Bristol as an option? Uh, yeah, well, I think uh, having worked with Pat before, previously, like obviously, I didn't get off to a great start in Sale, but. It was to, I was I was kind of in, in chats with Pat like in my sort of early years at Sale, um, but that no, nothing came of that. And then um, yeah, as you said, I was like six six seasons at, at Sharks, which was unbelievable. And um, like I, I love love my time there. Like it, it flew by, but I guess I just felt I, I needed a, ch a change really. Um, something to not not that I was lost my passion for it at all. I just I I I, I love the place, but. Um, I guess with the way I the way I kind of approach my own game and and the learning aspect, I felt I kind of got to a point at Sale where I'd worked with the coaches for six years and they taught me a lot and developed me a lot on and off the field and something new was just what what I was kind of chasing really and um I kind of gone into a contract year where like previously with Sale I would have, would have signed before my, I go into the sort of my last year and this time I I was in I was kind of open and that kind of made me dip my toe in the water and see what was what was out there really and um yeah I was yeah and and it, it happened to be Bristol and obviously very very happy decision I, I made and um uh, yeah the, the place down here is incredible so um still still settling in uh day by day getting more and more comfortable but uh, I'm enjoying it and then, you know, leaving Sale, you know, you're a big name player there and announcing, your, you know, when it gets announced that you're leaving, you know, does that affect the run-in at the end of the season or, or, or was it a smooth sort of, you know, final run-in run, run in there? Yeah, it's got, like, obviously I've never ex experienced that before. So um, for everything that Sale did for me, obviously I wanted to, you know, finish the season as well as I could and play my best rugby. Now I picked up a, a, a niggle, so that kind of prevented that and I... I I didn't get to go out in the swan song and um, really, um, I guess, repay, re repay everyone, like the, the, the people there, the coaches and, and the fans for what they did for me. But I guess uh, over the years, I, I like developed a lot of good relationships that uh, obviously will withstand me <laughs> moving to the Bears. So 
they just won't like me for two games a season. But um, yeah, no, it's 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 it, it felt felt like the right time for me. And then, you know, how has the, the move to Bristol been? Obviously not been there too long because of international commitments, but, you know, it's a bit, it's a nice town, Bristol. I, I really love it every time I go there. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is a, a popular place. I think before moving over, every everybody that I spoke to, obviously, because I've only li- lived in Manchester, um, never never been to Bristol Bar for games, but everyone I spoke to, like, speaks so highly about this part of a part of England. Uh, and yeah, like I'm, I'm actually out in, in the sticks a bit. I'm like 30 minutes north of the, or 20 minutes north of the city. Um, so yeah, it's an easy, easy venture in. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's very nice. The move day, we actually arrived in with two, two uh, lorries full of our stuff and weren't allowed in the house because the paperwork had, had been messed up. So there was a bit of a spanner in the works early on, but uh, yeah, we were, we managed to get that sorted. <laughs> and um, I think with anything, would like I'm not. Well, you obviously moved a lot in your life, um, but yeah, moving just and and having kids. There's we're a month here now, and there's just always seems to be something something to do in the house. So uh, it's, it takes a lot of organisation. Lucky, my wife is a, has been a superstar, and she's she's taking care of the majority of it. And, Give me a few little bits and pieces around the place to do. Good honour, mate. Good honour. Um, and then obviously, you know, w- what do you make of Bristol this season? You know, last year was, you know, they, they came off a really successful season the year before, dropped off in that semi final versus Quinns. But then last year, it just didn't click for them at all. Everyone thought it was going to be another step up and would they be contenders? And they went the other way. But what have you sort of felt with the preseason you've been there for and, and the team on a whole? And, and you did look back two more of the Bristol Bears that we sort of expected in, in the game against Bath on the weekend? Yeah, like, well, um, firstly, like, because obviously it's it's a, pretty much a brand new facility, like state-of-the-art, and it's, it's in, it, like, it's incredible. Like, I was lucky in, in sale with the facility we had there, but then this place is, like, just custom-built for, for rugby. So, um, yeah, everything is, like, exceptional. They really like... They don't. They haven't missed a trick. So in terms of coming down here and um, you know p- performance or development and like sort of reaching new heights, you know this is definitely like a really good place to be. So I'm fortunate in that aspect. And um, like yeah, as you said, I think even even the game Bath made made that like a dog fight really, uh, which I guess is is the derby and, and then their their style. So coming through that and. Um, yeah, it was how we kind of weathered some some purple patches was really good. But I've been I've been like really impressed with the place and sort of training training standards, the intensity of it all. So um, yeah, it was <laughs> some tough sessions when I when I arrived. Obviously, I had a, a few weeks off after the American uh, America camp, but uh, yeah, the first two weeks were, were pretty brutal. And how is uh, how has Pat been? You know, you, you work with him back up till sort of 2015, 16. Now you're back with him this time. Is is there a big change in him? Is he exactly the same? You know, what what's your observation so far? <laughs> um, On the spot. Change. Well, like I think the like the one thing is just like like the passion, the passion for it. Like that's the like I guess if you you meet him, you chat to him about the game. It's just his passion for it and his his knowledge for it. Um, and I guess as well because he was a, he, like he he played as well and he played at like incredibly high level. He's uh, probably got a, a great understanding of it too. So um, yeah, it's 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 been good. Like there's the obviously I think Bristol are known for sort of the way they they move the ball and how they that attack. And I had an, an idea of how that got, how they go about that with Matthew McConnacht and then. Now here as well, uh, just the detail that goes into everything and sort of players understanding the game and, and their knowledge of it is really good, backed up by probably the amount of work you, you do on just the, the basics of the game, like your catch and your pass. Uh, um, and, and like over and over again, the, the repetitions of that, just that like the, the simple stuff that you could probably overlook, like the, it doesn't happen here. It's like mornings, afternoons, it's skills, it's passing. Um, to then obviously be able to execute that un- under pressure. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 been very very impressive. Yeah, I've always heard he's a big like attention to detail sort of coach, like no st- stone unturned type of vibe. 
Yeah, yeah, that's it. There, it's very, it's like it's it's very measured, but it's also exciting as well because I guess, um, like sort of your 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 attacking plan for the week and how you want to break down uh, a defense or set piece attack. There's a lot like it. It's even for me like coming in. Uh, it's it's a lot more than what I was used to. And then, but I just like kind of a lot lads that have been here a long time. It's just like you say one thing and they all know they all know what to do. Um. So I'm I'm hoping to get to that get to that stage pretty soon because yeah, keep, that's keep just studying, it. mate. Yeah, yeah, got to do my hit the books and do my study. And and is that Bristol style of play was that a factor in in coming to the Bears? Obviously, Sale had a slightly different style, like you know, pl- played in the right areas and and had had moments, but Bristol seemed to be much more sort of ball in hand sort of team. Uh, yeah, de- I definitely like that. And that was the probably the like fascinating aspect of it when Alex Anderson came in and his sort of the defense and, and the kicking game, the transition obviously of what he developed, helped develop at Saracens, you know, um, the detail in that, like, I love that too. Um, and for the, the team we had at sale, it was like, we were just a, a lot of big, big angry men that want to beat yeah. people up. So that, that worked really well. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess here it, it is, a lot more focused on like the like with the ball, the expression, your ability to like catch pass in a straight line and um, sort of stand up defenders, two v ones, three v twos. Um, so yeah, that 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 definitely was a factor, and I think as well like my like my like I like my love for the game like probably extends into coaching it as well. And like um, I, when I was in Manchester, like I did a bit of coaching away from away from like my own training, so. Um, learning new things as well, and uh, yeah, that, that that was a big factor. Obviously, work work with new coaches is is uh, beneficial to that too. So, um, yeah, that that was part of it too. And I guess Bristol, you know, you've got some some big name players across the board in that team, and also some big sort of reinforcements coming in this year. Yourself and Genge, just two very sort of noteworthy signings. And, you know, in that opening game this weekend, you, you get to see those players in fruition. You coming on and, and Genge is just some some player. Like him and Sinclair together is like the Bash brothers. Like that to me is as good as it gets as a front row pairing. I know, yeah. Uh, obviously, <laughs> um, would have prepped for, for playing against Genji like over the years. And uh, yeah, been like, well, just the first try for like a loose head forward to, to do that. Um, like breakthrough two, do me the fullback. And then I think his, his, his second try was just, you're, you're like under 10s rugby, give it to the biggest kid, and like let him run through everybody. So, uh, yeah, first, like kind of like blown away a bit. Like when you watch him on TV, he actually doesn't look as big as he is in person, which is weird, but, um, yeah, like really, really, really powerful guy. And I think, um, Obviously, he's returned like Bristol's where he grew up, so he's very like emotional and passionate about that game last week. And geez, he he showed it on the pitch too, mate. He's just leveled up, mate. Like I I, I had to talk props on the scrum down, I couldn't yeah. not. But you know yeah, that guy yeah. is just. He's just rewriting the the ceiling of where props can be, like you know. He, he and it's the thing is, it maybe took him a couple of years to get that set piece down, which is always, you know, just time in the saddle and reps to get to like test level scrummager. But he's got to that. But then I also feel like his dynamicness is even better now than it was when he was younger, where that would set him apart. Now he's actually got like black belt set piece, and he seems to be even more <laughs> of an animal than he was before. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. And when I well, when I had moved, had come down and just popped in, he was obviously he must have been just back from from his Australian tour, and he was he was back in the gym pretty quick. Like so, there's no no off switch with him. So I think that I think they actually had to tell him or he's the or a few rules is that he has to have some time off. So yeah. he had to be he had to be sent away. I think, but um, yeah, I think himself himself and Carl probably. Yeah, brilliant scrummagers, and then different cars got some some lovely touches around the field. He's he's very skillful too. So soft hands for a batting ram as well. I, I'm yeah, a big fan yeah. of sinks as well. Um, all right. Well, last question on the Bristol Bears. But you know, what is the sort of goal of the squad? What's the internal mantra? Like, where are you guys aiming for? Top four, kind of win it. Like, what what what's sort of been the chat as a team this season? Um. Yeah, listen. I think like expectations, of course, are, are going to be high in Bristol. And, um, 
like it's a funny thing like babe like every game is kind of my sort of new sort of headspace is not having any expectations and not trying to control anything because I find I play better better that way or like you know when you go out to a game and you're just trying to bang how's on, it gonna go? bang on. Yeah, how's it get gonna out go? of the future get out of the future I always exactly, tell myself yeah. back to the get moment out. exactly um so uh I think there's obviously like a I think since I've since I've been in there now, I'd say I won't say culture, but like the team spirit, the way the boys sort of interact with each other and get on with each other is 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 like they're they're a very very tight group, um, which obviously goes a long way to to winning anything. Uh, it's probably the most important thing. Um, and then yeah, the hunger and the commitment. Listen, the the, the preseason was tough, so um, going into the season, listen, finish as high as possible, win win the most games. That's that's what that's what we're after, um, and it, it's going to be a competitive one, mate. Like the, the, all the teams are, are, are looking sharp. You know, a few results going different ways, but I think this is just going to be a, another tight year running competition. Yeah, well, like as you know, like it's just it is grueling. The teams are getting better and better, so it's probably yeah, um, winning as many games as you can by like not burning out the squad as well, because um, I guess. That was probably one thing I found last year was maybe with Sela, maybe burnt out a bit. But that, that's it's just so so important to get that that aspect of it of it right in the league. All right, let's move on to USA Rugby. And, uh, you know, quickly, for, for some listening, you know, they might not know you, sort of your origin story of how you, you played for the United States, but you came over here uh, from, you know, to play at Nyack New York Athletic Club, play your rugby there, and then through residency and doing a Masters here, you eventually found yourself playing for the Eagles. You know, how, how sort of roundabout a way was it that, you, you know, you got to where you are now, but it's, it's probably one of the most unique ways of anyone doing it? Yeah, like... Um... Yeah, like I, I, when I first got over to Nyack, was just kind of like a, a finished my university in Ireland and got a J1 visa and uh, a good few of my mates are moving over to New York to, to work and have a good time, really. Uh, so, yeah, geez, there was like, I think end of my year, there must have been like 20 went over and then there was 50 and then there was 100, and like just an incredible year in, in uh, New York. And I was playing a bit of rugby as well before it had gone over and that's, should have got me lined up in Nyack and through Nyack played against Life University. They were down in Atlanta and played them home and away. And then in like a semi final of the of the competition of the Eastern Conference. So um like my head was blown away with even that of like playing in New York, but we were flying to Dallas, flying to Atlanta, flying to all these places it was incredible. But um that sort of ran into my time down in Atlanta studying and coaching and playing in there was like three years of residency and then an opportunity to, I guess, like in an Eagles camp or domestic players camp before sort of the, the pros, the overseas guys. Um, so, yeah, like I said, a roundabout way. Um, and obviously a lot of people to, to, to thank for that. And then fortunate that, like, the, I guess the bulb, Bounced my way and my body was healthy and all that stuff, but that got me to a World Cup and through that connect and then sail and now now here I am in Bristol. So, um, yeah, it's a uh, bit of a mad story. Well, it's, it's for me, it's an incredible story because it's it's like you know you obviously sort of didn't go the traditional route, you know, especially in sort of the IRFU where you get streamlined into you know the provinces, then play for Ireland. But there's an argument that say you had or hadn't and say you weren't capped for the United States that you might have ended up playing for Arden with the form that you've put into the to the premiership and stuff as well which is amazing for America to have a 10 of that caliber but I think it's generally true like same with England after being there for five years at sale I reckon there would have been an argument at the time you might have got capped there as well yeah <laughs> I don't know I don't know about that but um yeah no listen because I, I, I think um before I'd gone over to America I was kind of like maybe looking at something in England or like a championship, but I never really like sent, sent out any stuff. But then again, when I was that age, I probably, I just was, didn't have the size for like your modern day rugby player and did some age grade stuff at Leinster. But John Cooney's who's at Ulster was like the nine that was my age grade. He went into the academy system. So that had kind of passed me by, but 
uh, I need to get over to the States and beef up a bit. <laughs> yeah, if you, if this is this is the place to beef up. Tell me about it. That's, <laughs> it's my constant battle living over here now. It's just not to get over 122 kegs. It's a it's a constant battle, mate. <laughs> yeah, well, you went the opposite way, didn't you? Yeah, I, I'm very different. Exactly. <laughs> I um I, I played USA under 19s, like under Salty, way back in the day when I was like 16, wow. and. Uh, I just got no love. I, I could obviously play for both, but I got no love from uh, no love from uh, England at the time. And then my last year of school, I just developed massively. Like I got way taller, started lifting weights, and that's when I got into London Irish Academy, and that's where I got into England everything. And you know, I went. I, that was the track yeah. I went. But I, I always think, what uh, what if? Because I had a place at uh, Cal Berkeley, and I don't know a lot of people know, but I was my plan initially was to finish school go play at Cal under Jack Clark. He'd help like recruit me. And that was going to be my initial plan. But London Irish contract at 17 was, was too good to turn down one year, <laughs> deferred it. And then after they offered me a two year, then I, then I sort of closed my, uh, the book on, on California Corbs as I call them. Yeah. But I always wondered where he might be. And then now I live in California. It's quite, it's quite fitting as well. But, uh, yeah. All right, let's transition to USA Rugby. And, and it's been a bit of a, you know, a tough sort of year or so for the Eagles, missing out at the end of back end of 2021 on automatic qualification as America's won, losing to to Uruguay in, in a two-game series that, you know, the loss they threw away at home must must sting so many. But then you didn't play in those, but then you were part of this summer where the, the, the campaign against Chile, home and away, and, and, and unfortunately, uh, you know, down at the wire it, it fell apart yeah 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 still like still can't believe it honestly um but i guess listen it like happened for a reason and but the truth, truth is just not like good enough for us really um because now credit to, to chile like they were they were a tough side and they, they battled away but it was a game that i think the first game just the conditions was just a, a mess and which was just great to get get in and out of the place uh, Santiago as quick as possible, um, but then coming home, like I was f- full of confidence, thought we were gonna like put put a number on them, really did, and they got out to a nineteen nil lead, and then kind of they just clawed back, and um, yeah, down 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 to the wire, just lost by a, by a point. So um, yeah, listen, like f- for me, as far as like camps go, and. Again, I think a big thing that's always spoken about is time together, and I do feel that's important. But um, it's like the guys have—I think since that that Chile game has been like a like not that we needed a wake-up call, but it, it is a, it is a wake-up call. And a lot of lads question themselves, and uh, I think just over the over the last two months and the chatting through the WhatsApp group, um, just kind of putting something in that we don't get to. November now and we've put ourselves in the same position so thankfully there's a there's another opportunity to, to get to a World Cup um, one that we all really want to we want to want to want to like um, take advantage of um, so there's that, the lads have been sl- slogging away and putting in putting a lot of work when you know there's no rugby on right now um, for lads based in America they're all doing individual work, so probably sacrificing a lot. And when you're running on your own, you, as you know, it's like dark, dark places. But um, a lot, a lot of the lads have have been doing the workouts been sent to them, and I think they just have a camp organised now that everyone's arriving into and hit the ground running from here. And obviously, um, it'll be three three weeks in Dubai with three games to win. So that's just where the focus is. And you know. What do you put like the game, the, the the loss of that second game in control, nineteen nil up, as you said, down to just lacks of concentration. Is it fitness at altitude? Do you think that's an issue, or or, or where, where do, would you put your sort of finger on of of how you get the game and get away from you? Because it's happened a couple times for the Eagles. It's not just a one off, and and that that's really why I'm asking someone very much in the know. Yeah, I would I would say uh, fitness is definitely a big part of it. And I think that's what we spoke about as a group. Um, like our standards um, need need to improve. Like I'd say since like we I I had said it about since 2018 that was probably our peak of having like a, a really successful year. And I don't mean like it was really successful, but we and, and we won games in 2018. But after that there was like a drop off, and there was a drop off in like 
our intensity on the pitch and there was a drop off in our in our um uh probably oh yeah just the overall fi- of fitness of the group and then i think with the mlr which is brilliant and you're hoping like uh, guys are playing more competitive games but it's still not at the, the level of of the international rugby when um I don't know. You're just it's it's just a different type of pressure and a different type of intensity that, uh, like I think if if we're honest with ourselves, if we were a fitter side, we we wouldn't blow like a 19 nil lead or we wouldn't let it collapse like that. So, um, and like I, like even for me, because not having played a lot of rugby towards the back end of the season, the second half of that game against Chile, my calves are cramping up. You know what I mean? And that's that's not good enough either. So, um, it's not like uh, when the game, I think when the game is, you can feel them sort of creeping in. It got kind of mindset shift was to protect the game and not go and win it. And that's probably the thing that hurts the most from from my perspective because guys are probably are responding off sort of the what I'm giving out, the energy I'm giving out, and if if I'm trying to like protect the lead, well then everybody's going to feel that feel that way. So um, that's probably the, the 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 biggest learning for me uh, from that Chile game. Um, but like as I said. There's a uh, as horrible as it feels. Like if we we could have, we obviously could have still won that, and just little yeah. things, little things went away. But then would we have this deep honesty and like sort of break it all down? Probably not. We'd be like, we got through it. You know what I mean? Um, no, I, I know what you mean, mate. Like I thought, you know, as a t- caliber of players on the field, far superior side. Like I do, th- there are mitigating circumstances. Chile have, you know pretty much year round time together, that squad and and from the club to country, so much continuity. And, you know, as you get into games and deeper in and fitness, all of that stuff together does add up. But I, I also just feel like we was, well, I also feel like USA was so much better than that um, of, 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 you know, what sort of happened in those games. And I guess, like you say, it's a big motivation looking forward, but now it is, you know, last chance saloon. You pretty much have to go three from three in Dubai. My understanding is that the, the domestic players are going to get a bit more time together to prepare to condition out there. And then you, the international boys, you'll just join in sort of week of that first game. Yeah, so the lads got together this week um, and there's there's uh, camps and then uh, sort of build up games, warm up games into that. So. Um, yeah, not going in entirely cold, but then obviously the guys that have got their domestic seasons in Europe, uh, obviously it's, it's not reg nine, so we don't come in till till November. So um, yeah, yeah, like I think as, as well, probably I'm not sure if like obviously the, the other teams like what their schedule is like, or are they coming in like fully fully cooked too? I'm not, I'm not sure of that, but yeah, I think that's uh, like a, a big factor of probably. Chile's time together because look back at like four four years ago, I think like where you're putting sixty points on the team and and a lot of a lot of their like obviously their their captain who was was on the receiving end of that four four years ago like speaking to him and some guys bailed and then they had to get guys that were fully committed and then they've had all that time together and they play in this large tournament so um, it is like. The time together is is hugely hugely beneficial for then understanding when I don't know certain things don't go your way or they're going your way how you sort of stay on task and not get distracted or loss of focus. So um, yeah, listen, I think narrowing it down to one thing is tough. Like um, like yeah, it's it was a, a bitter pill to bitter pill to swallow. Well, mate, I will leave it there, mate. We wish you all the best in those games. Obviously, good luck with everything with Bristol as well. We're excited to see you out there. You're a flag bearer for, for the United States, uh, playing at the highest level and really standing out. It's a, you know, it's an ace up the sleeves for US to even have a caliber ten like yourself, mate. So thanks for thanks for that, and thanks for coming on the show as well. Uh, thanks very much for that, course. Appreciate it, and uh, all, all the best, and hopefully see you over this side soon. Cheers, mate. Appreciate it. So good to have AJ on the show. So much insight from the man. You know, both our touch points here with NBC Premiership Rugby. Reminder, that is on Peacock TV, live and on demand every weekend. And also USA Rugby as they continue their hopeful quest to qualify for the 2023 Rugby World Cup in the repechage coming up. But 
that is a wrap on this week's show. Big thank you to all of you listening or if you're watching on the NBC Sports YouTube page. Thank you so much. We appreciate the support. Keep liking, sharing, favoriting, retweeting, telling your friends about the pod. We are going nowhere this year. We're going to keep growing, keep trying to cater to all the audiences, US-centric, but also around the globe with some great guests and insight that will be coming up in future weeks. Thanks again, and we'll be back next week. Thank you.